This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Before I jump into my guest today, I have a request, a favor, one of those things that every author hates doing. Go to Amazon and write a review of my newest edition of Trend Following. That's the one with the blue cover, 2017 edition. I want to see your feedback. Because if I don't ask the normal people for feedback, what I get are the crazies, the absolute lunatics, The people that are so disconnected, they wouldn't know up from down and down from up. And for some reason or another, maybe it's the tone of the voice that I'm using right now. For some reason or another, I attract the really, really crazy lunatics. (laughs) They, They seem to like me. It's some kind of like alternative perverse like. Instead of like trying to be my friend and maybe learn something from my research, they get so blasted into a cognitive dissonance that I have upset their apple cart, made their worldview go sour, and they implode internally. It's actually quite fun to watch. I've not stopped enjoying watching it for over a decade. It's frankly a blast. But that said, look, Amazon is a process. I want people to enjoy my work. I want people to see my work. And it helps for that to happen to go write a review. And if you like the book, what the heck? It keeps me going. It keeps this podcast going. That's got to be one of the best pitches ever to go write an Amazon review. And I just made it up on the fly. That's from the heart. So please, take your time. Head on over to Amazon and write something kind. Or if you are one of those really, really, really crazy nut jobs, give me the crazy nut job review. Those are fun too. I like them both. I like more normal people than the crazies, but it's a diverse world. We need both. My guest today is Martin Ford. He's the founder of a Silicon Valley-based software development firm, 25 years of experience in computer design, software development, and he also happens to be the best-selling author of Rise of the Robots, Technology and the Threat of a Jobless Future. I think you will enjoy the journey that Martin and I go on today to take you through what could happen. As a futurist, that's Martin's gig, as a futurist, he's trying to look ahead to see as we move to greater and greater technology, greater and greater automation, The crossover at some point in time in the future where computing power, computing technology becomes more human, where there is a cognitive element. What does this mean for us? Can we start to think ahead? Are there steps we can take today to mitigate this future if it unfolds as Martin sees? There is no one answer here. There is no necessarily correct answer here. But this is a lively discussion to get you thinking. Because let's face it, we all know these repetitive motion jobs are going by the way of the dinosaur. They're not going to be there. We can see it. We all know instinctively it's coming. And what will that mean? Will we as a race adjust and overcome? Or will technology overcome? Great questions, great thoughts. I hope you enjoy the insights from my guest today, Martin Ford. Martin, I see this word futurist, right? And and I know you probably use many different labels to describe yourself, but futurist is one that uh, many in the public will use to describe you. I would like you to take a step back and perhaps from your perspective, outline this term. And we can all think of the, you know, Ray Bradbury, we can think of Carl Sagan, we can think of, shoot, James Cameron and Terminator. I mean, you know, everybody, Star Trek, the original Star Trek, a lot of people have the forward 
thinking view. How would you describe futurists? And perhaps if you've got a unique spin on it for your own life. Right. I, I think that it is definitely a word that means different things to different people. For me, it really means looking at the future, but in a fairly specific way and focusing on specific areas where I think I have some competence and those those are revolve around the impact of of technology. And I got into this. I started as an engineer, as a computer engineer, and I worked in software development for many years, became very interested in the technologies of artificial intelligence and robotics, and then began to think seriously about how they would impact the economy and society in the future. And that's sort of how I got into it. So it's fairly, my focuses are fairly specific. Let me throw a a picture out, recent video clips that I've seen that I think will give you a way to, or both of us, a way to jump right in. Uh, there's, there's a firm out of Boston that's quite famous with their uh, Boston, I think it's Boston Dynamics, their dogs and whatnot. And I recently saw a robot doing a backflip and landing. Now, if these advances in technology don't cause people to pause, I mean, just those alone, I, I don't have your experience level at looking at these things, but just those alone are frightening. And at least it doesn't take much of an imagination to say the Terminator is on the way at a bare minimum. Certainly the, the advances in robotics and, and the videos from Boston Dynamics are are very visceral. People see it as visual, um, and it does demonstrate some of the amazing advances that have taken place here. But one thing I would say people need to be aware of is that actually a lot of the most meaningful advances, the things that are probably going to have a really big impact on people's lives quite directly, are a lot less visible than that. There are things happening in the background. Very often, they're just software, and there's going to be a, an enormous impact from those as well. So it's definitely not just about humanoid robots or, you know, physical robots that move around and, and, and can run and do backflips and stuff. It's much broader than that. This is a very broad-based trend. So, you know, I'm going to generalize a little bit here, but you have a basic thesis that in the future robots will dominate. I just brought up one example. You countered with another. Why don't we go down the path of yours? And for the audience out there that perhaps is not yet imagining past their web-based app or, frankly, Microsoft Excel, why don't you start to paint a picture of the advances? And why don't you also key in the notion of acceleration? Because we all tend to think as human beings on a kind of linear type scale. But when this starts to unfold, um, these advances that you were going to tell us about in a second, there's going to be an accelerated uh, rate, isn't there? That's right. And, and let me begin with that. If you go back to when first electronic computers were built, say, in the 1950s. We've seen something on the order of 30 doublings in computing power since then. And that's just an extraordinary number of times to take any number and double it. Uh, you can sort of imagine that by, by thinking about if you got into your car and you started going along at about 5 miles per hour, now gradually double your speed to 10, to 20, to 40. If you could do that just a handful of times, you obviously need a race car, right, and a, and a, and a race track. If you could do that 30 times, which is the number of times we've seen computing power double, you would be, you know, a spaceship traveling at millions of miles per hour, you know, faster than anything that, that we've ever actually built, something out of science fiction. And that's really where we are in terms of computing power today. And that's one of the main things that's really driving this. And so what has happened that we now have arrived at a point where computers are really, really fast, at least relative to what we saw before. Also, we have vast amounts of memory, and that is leading to the collection of vast amounts of data, and that data is being used increasingly in what's called machine learning, which is essentially smart software that can learn by itself just by looking at data. Another way of expressing that is to say that basically it's software that can program itself. One thing that you hear people say very often is that computers only do what they're programmed to do. And that simply is not true anymore. Computers are now learning to do things, at least narrow, specialized things by themselves. And that's really the underlying force of the disruption that I'm, I'm seeing in the future. And the reason is that computers and algorithms and robots broadly are going to get a lot better at doing a broad range of uh, specialized things. Really what it says is that anyone that comes to work and does something that's fairly routine and repetitive and predictable, if you come to work and you face the same sorts of challenges again and again, it doesn't have to be literally rote repetitive, but you're doing the same kinds of things, then that's exactly the kind of thing that is going to tend to be susceptible to machine learning. And that's going to be a whole lot of jobs at a whole range of skill levels, you know, everything from fast food workers 
to at the high end radiologists, you know, doctors that look at, at medical images. All of that is going to be more and more susceptible to to this technology. So we're looking at a very very big impact. Let me go back in time, and you would probably have a much better historical perspective than I. But this is not the first time that uh, us Homo sapiens have faced technological uh, advances. I mean, you know. Horse and buggy. I mean, you know these kinds of things. Um, so why why is this one in particular? And from your perspective, why is the current direction that automation and technology going so something for alarm and pause? Because I mean, I, as a as a kind of a optimistic guy, I would like to think that whatever uh, comes down the road, and if you know fast, look, you just mentioned fast food jobs. I don't think there's anybody listening that probably thinks we should be worried about advances that would eliminate fast food jobs. Why is this one so different? I know it's more than fast food jobs. It's going to be attorneys. It's going to be accountants. But won't us? Won't we as human beings adjust and wrap our arms around other opportunities that come with the elimination of these repetitive jobs? That's the argument, and it is an argument that a lot of smart people continue to make. So you would definitely find, you might well be able to find economists with Nobel Prizes who would make us, you know, essentially that argument. My belief, and I think the belief of many other people, especially who are perhaps fairly close to this technology, is that this time might well really be different. Fundamentally, what it comes down to is that this is much more broad-based than anything we've seen in the past. Uh, information technology, artificial intelligence is going to be a general-purpose technology. It's going to be something almost like electricity. It's going to scale across everything. When you say artificial intelligence, we're not there yet, right? I'm using the term a, a bit loosely to mean machines that can learn, that can do, that can do some intellectual task. We're certainly not at the point of having what we call strong AI or, or artificial general intelligence, or in other words, human-level artificial intelligence, a machine that can literally think like a human being. I mean, that, that lies far in the future. But we do have machines that are doing amazing things in terms of being able to solve problems and to learn and to make decisions and so forth. So they are, they are absolutely competing with us in the cognitive space, but in a very narrow, specialized way. And that's still, to, to my mind, we can call that artificial intelligence, although it's not it's not how from, you know, 2001, A Space Odyssey. It's not science fiction. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just, it was one of those things where I kind of, I thought it'd be good to have the definitional perspective down. Right. The point I was making is that this kind of, this kind of specialized artificial intelligence and robotics and, and, you know, thinking of it all collectively is going to be like a utility. It's going to be like electricity. It will scale across everything. It will invade every sector of the economy virtually every job that exists to some extent, every industry, every employment sector. When you say, for example, no one should be upset that fast food jobs are going to disappear, that's fine. But then it's also going to be self-driving cars displacing taxi drivers and Uber drivers. It's going to be smart algorithms displacing white-collar workers, many of which have, have lots of education. You know, it's going to be robots in Amazon warehouses. So it's really going to be everywhere, virtually everywhere. That isn't to say that every job is going to disappear, but a very large fraction might. And, that, and so the size of the disruption could be much larger than what we've seen in the past. And I think that really what it comes down to is that finally we're getting to the point now where technology is beginning to compete with our core competency. I mean, you, you can ask the question, given that what you say is true, that in the past we've always been able to adjust to find something new to do, why is that? Why, why don't we have unemployment? Because, you know, technology has clearly been advancing for basically forever, but certainly since the Industrial Revolution at a very, fairly uh, rapid pace. So why aren't we all unemployed? The, the answer is, of course, our brains, our intellectual capacity, our ability to learn, to do new things, to retrain and to remain relevant. But the point is that smart algorithms, robots, machines in general are now pushing into that space. They are taking on the capability to compete with us in that way as well. And that, I think, eventually it will make it hard for a lot of average people, especially, to, to really adapt to this. I mean, keep in mind that there is, you know, a normal distribution of capability in the economy, right? I mean, if you think of an average worker that's average intelligence and capability, you know, half of the distribution is people that are either right at average or, or below average. And, and a lot of those people are really best equipped to do things that are fundamentally routine and rep repetitive and predictable. I mean, they're not people that are really 
realistically going to be engaged, for example, in highly creative activities and so forth. And and the reality is that, you know, machines are going to really begin to vaporize all of those jobs on that 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 sort of left side of the normal distribution. So, I, I mean, I think we're looking at a, a major disruption. It's not something that's going to happen instantly, but I believe as we look forward to 10 years from now, 20 years from now, somewhere in that time frame, we are looking at a very substantial disruption. And, and people that have tried to analyze this and figure out just how many jobs might be at risk have typically come away with estimates of something on the order of 30% to 50%. You know, So it's a big number. Let me push back on your saying not instantly and spread out over 10 to 20 years. And this is just kind of a simple little example. I'm sure you've got many more. I look at something like the acceptance of Dropbox. Okay, I've been using FTP for 20 years. Okay, so Dropbox wasn't like the biggest innovation in the world. They made it easy. But I'm amazed these days that if I tell almost anybody that I have no relationship with, hey, send it to me at Dropbox or hey, I'll send it to you on Dropbox. There's never any question. It's like people just understand and we are adopting these technologies so fast the question i have to you when you say and I'm, I'm sure you've thought about this you you lay out the general time frame 10 to 20 years however if i'm a businessman out there and i have to have a staff of cpas or a staff of lawyers or whatnot whatever that goes into my business if someone gives me the technological advance there's a good chance, isn't there, if I'm trying to put my own futurist hat on, isn't there a good chance that we all adopt these technologies at a much faster clip than any of us can imagine? That's absolutely possible. And when I say 10 to 20 years, I'm being relatively conservative, I think. And I certainly know many, many technology people, many people that are experts in things like machine learning who, who would argue exactly that, that it could happen a lot faster. And certainly it will happen faster in certain areas. I mean, your, your point about the adoption of technology is certainly true. I mean, maybe the best example of all is Facebook, right? I mean, look how, how fast that grew. In, in the commercial arena, it's going to happen too. I mean, I, I just not too long ago heard a quote from the uh, the CEO of Deutsche Bank saying that he believes he can probably get rid of half of his workers in that bank. And I mean, he didn't put a time frame on it, but but there is, you know, a, there are a lot of people out there thinking at that level of disruption. And we don't really know what's going to happen. And that's part of the reason that I think is very important to begin thinking very seriously about this issue now and not dismiss it as something that is, you know, 100 years away or, or it's never going to happen because we don't know how fast it's going to happen. For most of us, we can all imagine this. This is not out of the realm of imagination anymore. This isn't like, you know, Captain Kirk in 1968. This is all very imaginable. Right. I think most average people, most typical people imagine it. It's not something that is really penetrated the political arena too much yet. I mean, you hear, you hear certain certain mentions of it. And and again, if you look at professionals like economists and, and, and policymakers, I mean, they're certainly aware of the argument, but they, they do tend to be on the more skeptical side, I would say on whole. I'm not letting you get to the controversial part of your perspective yet. I want to keep you at one trigger, though, if there is one trigger. You mentioned your background, your tech background. Is there a trigger? Is there a moment for you in the last five, 10 years because, look, people could say you're evangelist for this, you know, for this perspective. Was there a moment for you, someone, something that you saw, the reading? What was the trigger that caused you to be like, wow, this is, I know this deep in my bones is going to happen. You can't, you can't necessarily predict it 100%, obviously, but you just know deep in your bones it's going to happen. What was the trigger for well, you? Well, there wasn't a specific trigger, but it is something I've been thinking about for a long time, for more than 10 years now. I, as I said, I had a career in, in software engineering and computer engineering, so I've always someone that has been very close to Moore's Law. So I've seen, you know, very close up how not just computers have gotten faster, but but how software tools for doing software development have gotten dramatically better and so forth. And I was running a small software company through most of the mid-1990s through through the mid-2000s. And, in, and I saw even in my own small business how a lot of jobs evaporated. It used to be that software was... Well, at least for Windows, it was basically a tangible product. I mean, it was something that was on a CD-ROM, and you had to put it in a box physically and, and, and send it to a customer by UPS or something. And so there was work there for typical average people that didn't necessarily have a lot of education to do that kind of manual labor. And I saw in my own small business how rapidly that disappeared. And, of course, today, you know, software is something that you either you download or maybe 
it's not even delivered at all. Maybe it's, it's hosted in the cloud. So that, that has changed quite dramatically. So I saw that in my business. And of course, you saw the same thing in music and in ebooks and, and various things. So that's part of it. I started thinking about this very seriously around 2007, 2008. And I actually wrote my first book about this. It was a self-published book called The Lights in the Tunnel back in, and it was published in 2009. And, and the other thing that got me really thinking about it was the advent of the financial crisis. And that got me focused from another perspective, which is what is the economic impact of this? What happens if no one has a job? You know, what happens to the economy? One thing obvious is no one can pay their, their mortgage then, right? Which is what we were seeing back in 2008. So I started thinking about this very seriously then and then published uh, my first book. Uh, back in 2009, and then that book was successful enough that it, that it led to my second book, Rise of the Robots, which has really gotten uh, a lot more exposure. So those are probably the things that kind of motivated me to become very, very interested and, and in fact, concerned about this issue. So before I take you into some policy ideas, which I, I know uh, by definition are controversial in modern-day America, there are it's a pretty split place these days, but I must share with you, as you talk about the mid-1990s, in 1995, I was living very close to Washington Dulles Airport, very close to America Online. And I watched that Netscape IPO in the summer of 1995. And I thought to myself, this is the most amazing thing. It was an instantaneous thought. I thought to myself, this is going to be the elimination of all these office jobs, all these office towers and parks they keep, build, keep building. I'd like, this is going to be the end of it. It's all going to stop. And then what happened? We had 20 years of building more office parks. So I think my perspective, uh, being my, my kind of very, uh, I don't know, basic uh, futurist, it, it's going to eventually happen. It just didn't happen as fast as I thought it would happen. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I think that, that that's one thing I've, I've also thought about just from a real estate perspective is that we've got all these office towers, commercial buildings full of cubicles with knowledge workers sitting there, people sitting in front of a computer. What's the economic in impact of those if they're not producing local tax revenue for the for the local communities? Boom. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's dramatic because, uh, and, and you know, those jobs are fairly easy to, li to eliminate. They are not subject to any kind of regulatory control. I mean, people talk a lot about self-driving cars because it's very visible and obvious, but actually that's, it's a very tough problem to solve. Lives are at stake. It has to be almost a perfect technology and there's all kinds of regulatory hurdles. So I think that's going to take actually a little bit longer than a lot of people estimate, although it will happen. But you know, if you're basically an office drone, someone sitting in front of a computer doing something routine, cranking out the same kind of report again and again, you know, manipulating information or extracting information from a system and then presenting it in some coherent way as a report, as a presentation, all that stuff is in fact already being automated. I mean, there, there are companies like Narrative Science and Automated Insights, which are automating journalism, you know, that automatically have systems that look at data and then generate a new story from that. So that's going to get a bigger, you know, bigger and bigger. And I do think that a lot of white collar jobs are ultimately going to be threatened by that. Let's open this up to the uh, to the fun part of this conversation. Now, I have my own bias. My own bias is I haven't held a job since I don't know when, the early 1990s maybe. So it, there's there's not been I've just been a guy who has essentially uh, had a career that if there wasn't that Netscape IPO, I probably would not have had the same career. I would have just maybe been one of the uh, the office cube folks that we're kind of talking about. But if if we go down this path and things start to unfold like you're imagining, like you're forecasting, you know, 50% unemployment is devastating for, right, this is, if, if you can't get around the automation and there there's not enough people that think like you or me and we can just kind of go out there and uh, invent something and kind of scrape by and live on our, our you know, our wiles, this, this presents a really, really basic problem of how does one live in a modern Western economy, even some of the Eastern economies, China, et cetera, where you don't have all those jobs and they could go away very quickly. Your solution is to posit the idea that there should be a basic income. Why don't I let you explain further? First of all, we don't have to take it to extremes. I mean, we don't have to talk about a 50% unemployment rate. I mean, right now we got an unemployment rate, a headline unemployment rate, rate below 5%. 
but we've got all these people that have left the labor force and we've got this opioid epidemics so are already seeing an impact you know a big social impact it's so, an underreported mess yeah so if we, if we really saw it unemployment of 10 20 percent i mean that would be that alone would be devastating it doesn't have to be 50 but so it is a big problem and it could be a devastating problem as you think about it, if there literally are not jobs there, or at least jobs that are not within the capability of people to do, then what are you going to do? You've got to do something, and you've got to do something for two reasons. First, because people obviously have a, have to have an income to survive, so they're not living on the street. And secondly, people need money to spend to drive the economy. You know, you've got to have consumers. You can't have you can't have capitalism without consumers, without someone to create demand for the products being produced. Um, otherwise, you, you really run the risk of getting into a downward spiral. I advocate for a basic income. That doesn't mean that I'm really an evangelist for that, or I think it's just a fantastic solution to all our problems, a panacea. It clearly has problems associated with it. Um, it's not something that anyone who thinks clearly should be enormously enthusiastic about, I don't think. But it probably is a direction that we're going to have to move in. And I view it as a beginning. The idea is we're going to give everyone an income, but it's not just that. I think that idea can be refined and improved and improved in a way that maybe addresses some of the concerns that are, that obviously arise. The biggest concern that arises is one really of, of incentives. You know, if, if you just dump money on people, then many people would be concerned that they'll just play video games. They'll do nothing. They'll have a totally unproductive life. But there, there would be some percentage that does that, for sure, right? I mean, Right, there course. definitely will be some, you know, and that's unavoidable. That's the basic cost of, of having a program like that. And, and that happens already, to, right, to some extent anyway. But we do want to make sure that there are incentives in place so that the number of people that would make that choice is fairly minimal. The thing that I worry about, the most is really education. You know, imagine that you're a high school student that's struggling to get through high school. You know that if you graduate from high school, maybe that's really not enough to get you much of a job in this environment. It really doesn't count for that much. On the other hand, if you just drop out of high school, you're going to get the same basic income of every, as everyone else. So to me, that cr- creates a very perverse incentive to just give up. So I would say, actually, we should build some incentives into the basic income. For example, if you graduate from high school or you, you pass the test to get a high school equivalency, then pay people a little bit more, a higher income. And, there, and the reason to do that is that we need an educated population. You know, we need an educated electorate. One of the issues we have, though, right, to, right now with modern day education in America is, yeah, we need an educated public, but my gosh, what are they being educated on? Because, you know, if you think about it, you, you, you're talking about running a, a small software company. I've been an entrepreneur. You know, one of the things that I would I tell people all the time, I say, well, what was the only thing you learned, Mike, in an undergraduate program, in an MBA program? And I say, well, I learned the definition of a sunk cost and an opportunity cost. But I mean, so it, it, it seems like to me that in the modern day education, we are simply teaching people to be, in many cases, these very repetitive perspectives and jobs that we are actually thinking could go by the way of the, the, uh, the dodo bird. You know, that's a good point. Still, if in the future there aren't going to be enough jobs, then, then we can change our attitude toward education. I mean, right now, it has become very vocational. I mean, we're thinking we need to educate people for a job so they can get a job. And that's especially true of the parents of college students who are paying enormous sums so their kids can go to college and then, you know, they want them to come out and get a job, right? So it is, everything has become very vocational. And maybe at some point in the further future, we, we can imagine where education isn't viewed in quite that way. It's, it's just viewed as something that makes you a, a broader, more educated person and, and a better citizen and a better member of society. And you can learn whatever you want. Maybe you want to focus on art or literature or something that doesn't necessarily lead to a fantastic job. So it may, may could actually lead to a rebirth of, of many of these traditional liberal arts type areas, I think. Uh, you've run the basic income idea uh, up the flagpole, I'm sure, in many audiences. I'm sure you've had uh, spirited debates about it. I can, I can imagine that many people, perhaps in the kind of University of Chicago camp, and I might even be very close to that camp, would probably say, gosh, just why not keep the optimistic view of letting market forces unfold in the future? Aren't we better there than, for example, having the state have that much power over people's lives? What I I really want to get from you is that you must be imagining that what will unfold will just make those kinds of debates pointless. 
the pushback I get is not so much from the University of Chicago people as more from maybe from social conservatives who just don't like the idea of giving people money for nothing. I mean, speaking of the University of Chicago, one big proponent of, of a negative income tax, which is, you know, sort of a kind of basic income was Milton Friedman. Friedrich Hayek was also a proponent of a guaranteed minimum income. So it actually has been a libertarian idea. It's presented as a libertarian alternative to the welfare state that is is advocated by people on the left. And the idea is that rather having the government get involved to you know figure out who needs benefits, to take care of people, be a nanny, all of this stuff, you just give people money, and then they go out and they participate in the market. Um, and it's actually um, a more market-oriented approach to a safety net. So it, it's interesting that it's an idea that has gotten support from both sides of the political spectrum, but actually quite a bit of support from libertarians and you know, people who are you know, conservative in terms of markets. So, so it is a, an idea that's, that's fairly broad, and it's not, it definitely is not a form of socialism, and it is not about the government taking over the economy. It's about creating a mechanism that gets money into the hands of people who don't have money so that they can then be part of that market. When you say it, though, I, I mean, I guess I am one of these one of these guys that's got Ayn Rand books ringing around in his head. So when I hear, when I hear it, I just I want to be the guy on the other side that says I want to be more optimistic that the, the human condition will figure these problems out. And it just feels on first blush. Maybe I am one of these. I, I'm really not a social conservative, but I'm, cause I mean, I've kind of like when it comes to, I always, you know, okay, keep your, keep your Mr. Government, keep your hand out of my, uh, my pocketbook in my bedroom. So I don't know where that puts me. I just, it just seems like something where it's like a last resort to me. That's what I, that's what it feels like to me. It feels like a last resort. And I guess what I'm really trying to get from you, it is from your perspective, truly a last resort too, right? It's not something that I would rush into. It's something that I believe we probably will need to do eventually because of technology. There are certainly many other people out there who are strong advocates of a basic income and have been advocating that for years and believe that it simply is a better approach than what we're doing now. That includes even you know another very conservative guy that, that actually wrote a book about this is, is Charles Murray. Is a big proponent of a basic income. He wrote that book, I think, back in 2006 or something, and it wasn't on the basis of what was happening with technology. He just thought he wanted to replace the existing social safety net that we have with, with something that he felt would be more efficient. But I, let, let me make a couple points that, to kind of address the concerns that I think most people have, and that is that the first thing to understand is that a basic income would be minimal. So it's enough so you can survive. It's a floor. It's not something that is going to give you this cushy living. So most people are not going to be satisfied with that. So therefore, there is immediately an incentive to work more. And that brings you to the second key thing, which is that the way you structure the basic income is in a way that you never penalize someone for working. In other words, you'll get your basic income, but if you also work, whether it's part-time or full-time or whether it's doing something entrepreneurial, starting your own business, if you do those things, you will always be better off than if you don't do those things. And that is, is really the key difference to point to relative to our existing safe, social safety net, where you get some benefits, but only if you're not working, only if you don't have an income. And what that means for people low on the income scale is that as soon as they try to do something to earn some money, they lose what they have, and they're, they're effectively no better off. So that really creates just an enormous marginal tax rate on, on those first few dollars that they earn when they're down at the bottom. It creates, in essence, a poverty trap. And you see this, you know, all over the place. You see it quite, quite vividly in Scandinavia because the benefits that people can get for unemployment and so forth there are very, very generous. And so what you have is theoretically you can have someone who say works in fast food at McDonald's and doesn't earn very much right next door to that person. You've got someone that's not working at all and is drawing benefits, and they their incomes may be roughly equal or pretty close to equal. And so the person who's working the McDonald's jobs looked at, looks at the neighbor and says, you know, what's going on here, right? Um, so there is that that disincentive to work that's built into structuring benefits so that only people that aren't working or are unemployed or or whatever get them. Let me keep you at this for one more second. I want to get you to. I want to take you in a different direction, but I'm thinking of social security benefits. And I know by some time in my early thirties, I had paid in the amount of money to social security that had capped my benefits. So whenever 
at some point in time in the future, I quote, retire, my benefit will be capped. However, that doesn't mean for the last almost 20 years, that doesn't mean Mr. Government hasn't been taking the Social Security piece from me every paycheck, because they have. So it's just been an extra tax. I'm curious with this universal basic income, is the idea that that would be standard for everybody no matter what, and then if you wanted to go become an entrepreneur, you would still get that benefit? Or if you became an entrepreneur, kind of comparing this to Social Security, if you became an entrepreneur and you made enough money, then they take your basic income benefit away from you. How, how would that work? Yeah, I mean, there are different views on that. A, a, a purist, someone who is really believes in an unconditional basic income, believes everyone is going to get that. So Warren Buffett's going to get it. Bill Gates is going to get it. But a thousand dollars a month or whatever. Obviously, the people at the top are going to be taxed more, and that's you know going to make up for it. You don't necessarily have to do that. I think my, myself that it, you can phase it out, but it's got to be at a relatively high uh, level of income. Because again, if you if you phase it out at a low level of income before someone is solidly into the middle class, then you're creating a disincentive for them to do that, right? Then you're gonna they're gonna end up not working and staying with the basic income. You don't want to phase it out until it is clearly. You know, no one would want to give up what they, their much higher income that they have in order to, to get that basic income. So you can phase it up. I mean, one idea that I've also put forth is that you could create or you could treat what I would call active income and passive income differently. So passive income would be social security, a pension, passive investment income, you know, that kind of thing. So someone that's, you know, super wealthy just basically clipping coupons, getting huge investment returns, maybe wouldn't get it. But anyone that is generating income through active means working, actually running a business actively, you won't phase that out. And, and therefore, you, you preserve that, that incentive. Well, let me throw something out at you. If, if this was to happen in the future, because let's say your worst case scenario unfolds, a severe unemployment bump up. If this was to unfold and then we gave everybody the universal basic income because it's frankly needed, they, they can't survive, but it's not like they're going to take that. I mean, if, if, we, if we're to the point where this is needed because jobs are being eliminated, okay, then we give everybody the universal basic income to keep them going. It's not like they're all of a sudden going to be turned into entrepreneurs because society and automation have already said there are no more opportunities. What I'm imagining in the future is what is everyone doing if there are no jobs? Okay, we cover their basic expenses, but then what the heck is everyone doing if there's nothing to do? Well, no, there definitely will be things to do, and, and some of them will be in the business world. And, and I, I wouldn't really agree that, that there won't be entrepreneurs. I mean, for someone that wants to start a business in the future, they're going to be incredible tools, right? All this artificial intelligence, robotics. But let's keep it at the masses for a second. If we Let's say we go down the path, and I'm kind of agreeing with you. I'm saying, okay, if this happens, I'm just, you know, hypothetically, if this all happens, we have to go with the... Uh, the UBI, most of those people that are getting the UBI, they're not going to really have opportunity because the, the very reason they're getting the UBI is because there is the opportunity has been clipped by automation and technological advances. Could we imagine, though, in this future where their UBI becomes the sole piece of income and then there's just not a, a lot for people to do? I'm putting, I'm following along you with the futurist view and saying, God, what, what could yeah, happen? Yeah, that could happen. I think that's far in the future. I mean, you know, this will happen somewhat gradually. You know, in phases, it's not going to instantly be the case that no one's working and, and everyone's just having a basic income. So, uh, you, you know, there are, you, one thing you could do is you could do a work sharing program where maybe everyone gets a basic income and they also work 30 hours a week or 20 hours a week, right? And you, and you share the work that is there between people. And, and But over time, it's true, it might get less and less, uh, at least for most people. You know, for some people, there, there definitely will be those entrepreneurial opportunities. But then your question is, is valid. What are people then going to do? And that, that's something that we're going to have to find a solution to. And I do think it is certainly important for people to have meaning in their life to do something that matters. Now, and this, this is the first criticism that always comes up when I talk about a basic income. You know, if people aren't working, they're going to have no dignity. I mean, that really is not true. It's possible to find dignity and purpose without doing something that earns you a living. I mean, okay, look at Bill Gates. Bill Gates did a lot up until he got into his mid fifties, then he retired, and now he's still doing something meaningful. But he's not he's not earning money anymore. He's independently wealthy. I mean, no one says, Oh, we're worried about Bill Gates' dignity just because he's rich. So so this argument about the dignity of work, no one ever applies that to wealthy people that, that have accumulated assets and now no longer have to work to, to earn an income. 
a living. So we can sort of think of a scenario where everyone is in some sense wealthy as a base, you know, simply as a result of, of the advance of the overall prosperity of our economy. Um, so that everyone at least has that minimum safety net. And, 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 you know, people do do other things that matter, right? They go out and they volunteer in the community. They, they edit Wikipedia. They, they, you know, if software programmers do open source software for free where they work on projects, people can do things for the environment. You know, you, you can, if, if you're, so inclined, you can be an artist. I mean, now not many people can make a living being an artist. In the future, you might that might be quite viable. That you can. If your goal is to get people thinking about what could happen if I'm going down the path of of your your direction, you've now got me thinking about all the various possibilities. I would love for you though to pick apart one that I know you've done some work on. I would like for you to paint a picture for my audience, a particular uh, aspect of the economy and how automation, how intelligence could affect those jobs, those careers in that space. And that'd be healthcare. I'm really curious to hear your perspective on how healthcare can really change. Because look, the system, even though we've had all these great debates about insurance and whatnot over the last couple of years, the system's pretty much still common. It hasn't changed that much in America. You have doctor's offices, you have hospitals. Can we see something in the future where technology just turns that upside down? I, I think it's it's quite possible and likely we're eventually going to see a disruption. It is true that healthcare is one of the toughest nuts to crack. And, and, and there are two sectors of the economy, education and health care, which both rely really on what you would call personal attention, right? I mean, if you're a doctor or a nurse, you have to be right there giving – applying your personal time and labor to a patient, you know, a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So it's not scalable in the way that in manufacturing you can scale, you know, cranking out widgets basically, or in the technology, you know, something like Facebook obviously is scalable. So that's the problem we run into. That's what's been called the, the cost disease, right? But I do think that, that that is changing. We already are seeing definitely the, the advent of robots that, that are being used in healthcare. A lot of those are very specialized. They do things like delivering stuff in hospitals. Pharmacy robots are 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 a big thing. The more routine aspects of healthcare can be can be automated. Um, it is still very very hard to build a robot that can do, for example, what a nurse does, because it just takes an incredible amount of dexterity, mobility, moving around, interacting with patients in a very unpredictable, chaotic environment. I mean, w you know, it's it's science fiction to have a robot do what what a nurse does. So it's not going to happen for a long time. So, you know, progress there is going to be maybe a little bit slower. Speaking in terms of artificial intelligence, I think that is going to be quite transformative in many areas of, of medicine. Certainly in radiology, we're already seeing, you know, major advances. There are some systems that can already outperform a human doctor, at least in some cases, at recognizing a tumor in a medical image. That technology is advancing very rapidly, and artificial intelligence is going to become a very, very powerful tool used by doctors. I think it is going to increase the accuracy of diagnosis and treatment. It's going to be kind of – it'll be almost like a con constant second opinion. Like every time you see a doctor, that doctor will access an AI system, and so in, in essence, it will be like talking to two doctors, one of which – basically has all the knowledge, you know, available in medicine is, is literally one of maybe the, the most knowledgeable doctor in the world. And, and, you know, IBM Watson, for example, has been working in that area. And there are certainly other endeavors as well. So there are a lot of reasons to be very hopeful that these technologies are going to be transformative in medicine. But I tell you what, it's going to take longer than it is in manufacturing in fast food. And that's one of the unfortunate paradoxes is that it would be better if medical care were more efficient than, than making hamburgers, but it's kind of the opposite. The fast food stuff is ready to change almost overnight, isn't it? I mean, that's just going to be so quick, I think. Sure, but there are a number of companies working on that. I mean, there's a company called Momentum Machines that I, I mentioned in my book that's in San Francisco. They've been working on this actually for a long time. So maybe it's, it is actually a more difficult problem than you might think because they've been at it for years. But they are now, I, I understand, at the point where they're going to open up a storefront and and test their equipment, you know, and you'll be able to go in and, 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 and buy a hamburger. There's another machine or another company working on it as well. So I, I do think that's inevitable. To some extent, the fact that wages are relatively low in fast food is maybe held back progress because of the trade-off between the cost of labor and cap capital is, is such that the incentive is not so great. But that may slow it, but, but you know, it's eventually going to happen for sure. As a, as a side tangent, something we kind of chatted about in email 
before this conversation. I should say, I don't want to name uh, the city right now, but I happen to be in a, an Asian country and I happen to be in a very large city, uh, over 10 million people. It's very modern in many ways. It's still developing in many ways. Most people here don't trust the tap water. For years, it's you just drink bottled water. You don't even think about it. You've gone down this path to join a firm where water scarcity is the mission, the purpose to help solve that. And one of the stats that I saw across your firm, which is really uh, amazing, and I'd like for you to put this in context, what it really means, in less than 10 years, 1.8 billion people dealing with water scarcity. I mean, you just don't get by your daily life. You don't have a nice life if there's no water. I mean, it's like, it's the basic building block. That's right. It is something that is absolutely essential. And this is the other big trend that I sort of see. I mean, I, one trend that I worked on is, is AI and robotics. The relentless trend toward water scarcity is, is really another thing that I think is just critically important. And of course, it is being driven in part because of climate change. Many regions of the world are becoming more arid. You know, arable land is turning into deserts, you know, and, and groundwater is being used. Uh, so in any case, the, the company that, that we have formed is a startup company called Genesis Systems. But the technology that we're working on is a revolutionary form of atmospheric water generation. And what that means is extracting water directly from the air, which is actually not something brand new. I mean, basically, that's what a dehumidifier does. I mean, if you've ever seen a dehumidifier. I have one right now in the, in the room that I'm sitting. Right. However, that is a very inefficient, very energy intensive process. What we have after doing a great deal of research is a really a revolutionary technology that does that much more efficiently, that ultimately will be able to generate water in industrial quantities in most some of, in some of the most arid regions of the world and it will be do, doing that uh, using modular units that are powered for example by solar powerful power uh, for example and and therefore are not dependent on existing infrastructure and so forth so this is going to be incredibly disruptive in many regions of the world and 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 one just to give you one example, think of the Middle East, um, and in particular, the Arabian Peninsula. Now, in a country like Saudi Arabia, they don't have any surface water at all. There are no lakes, there are no streams, there are no rivers. So historically, they've relied on underground water, underground res reservoirs. Those are getting very close to exhaustion. Um, they've been, you know, they haven't been managed especially well. There really isn't a lot of water left there. And as a result, Saudi Arabia is now completely dependent almost on desalination. They've built these massive desalination plants. And of course, these plants are enormously energy intensive, enormously capital intensive. I mean, they're big projects to build one of these things. And of course, they have to be located on the coastline. But that is the main source of water for both Saudi Arabia and the Emirates right now. But there is actually another problem that most people aren't aware of is that desalination may not, at least in that area of the world, even be sustainable. And the reason is that the Persian Gulf or the Arabian Gulf, whatever you want to call it, is not very deep. It's actually in many ways more like a lake. And so what happens with desalination is you bring the water in, you take the salt out, and then you eject the salt or, or the brine back into the water, and the water keeps getting saltier and saltier. And so then it, it essentially becomes unsustainable. It takes more and more energy to get water out again. And, of course, it's also destroying, you know, marine habitats. I mean, you know, marine life can only tolerate so much salt, so it's not good for the environment. That may actually not be a sustainable solution. So what we're offering with Genesis is going to be a much more portable, smaller, modular unit that doesn't take anywhere as the near uh, capital investment of desalination. It can be located anywhere. It does not have to be near existing sources of water, whether it's the ocean or, or wherever. Um, can be self-powered through solar energy. We'll work in countries like you know Iraq that don't necessarily have access to the ocean, right? Can really be used everywhere. So we, we think it's going to be just incredibly disruptive. Um, it's really a technology that is dramatically more efficient than anything that's come before it. And, and you know, this is something that, that is very much in the news. Actually, in the New York Times on the front page today, there is a big story about Cape Town, South Africa, which is literally, literally going to run out of water probably in April. Um, they have exhausted their groundwater, which is their only source of water. Um, so come April, they're going to turn off the water for nearly everyone, and people will have to go to some distribution point to get limited quantities of water. They're 
expecting they're going to have to mobilize the military in order to, you know, keep peace in the city. I mean, that's that's the level of problem that, that we're talking about here. So it is an enormous problem, and it's something that you know, as I work in, in Silicon Valley, and what I see is a lot of people here that are just very, very smart, the smartest people in the world, but at the end of the day, what they're working on is figuring out how to get people to click on ads. Now that I'm in the headspace of thinking of the future, so I think right now we're at 7.5 billion people on the planet. I believe that's, give or take, a number. That's that's where we're at. So let's imagine in some point into the future that 7.5 billion becomes 15 billion people. Let's say it's within 10, 20 years. I don't know how fast that could happen. If we get on one of these accelerated curves, one of these baby booms, who knows? My question to you, can you imagine a time where the human population keeps growing, keeps expanding, and technology will be able to solve the most basic human issues, uh, for example, food, water, pollution, you know, the, the, the byproducts of all these humans, they keep creating messes. Will technology be able to solve all, all of this into the future? Or is there, uh, is there a point where there's too many people? I, I tend to believe that there is kind of a point where uh, simply, you know, you know, we overwhelm the carrying capacity of the planet. So I, I you know, I think technology is critical and that we're going to have to rely on techn technology, but, but I don't think we can allow the population to go, you know, to 15 billion people or something. I think the, the current estimates are that it's going to sort of level out after 9 billion or so. And, but one of the main reasons that, that analysts who look at that expect that the population will level off is that as, as populations become more wealthy, they have fewer children, right? And, and this is especially true for women that have more economic opportunity and especially, you know, young girls can go to school and so forth. And then when they become adults, they end up having fewer children and, and a more prosperous society, of course, means that fewer babies die and therefore parents don't feel the need to have five or six kids to make sure that, that, you know, one or two survives. So as that happens, as that process continues, hopefully that will sort of tame population growth and we'll, we'll keep it to a sustainable level. But we absolutely are going to have to rely on technology. Let me take population growth out for a second. Let's assume no great population growth, as you just outlined. Can technology still, in the next 10 to 15 years, 20 years, can you imagine a time where we do solve I mean, for example, the pollution issues. I mean, it's so terrible. Everyone, you know, whether you've been in L.A. smog or Beijing smog or something, I mean, it's just we can have all the political debates we want, but nobody wants their city to have this haze hanging over it. Is there going to be a technological solution to eliminate? I think that, there, you know, there will be. I'm an optimist. Um, I, I do believe that, that technology can be a big part of the solution. And I think that things like advances in artificial intelligence will be the tool that we'll use to, to make a lot of those advances. So I, I do tend to be optimistic, but I don't underestimate the, the, you know, the degree of the challenges. I mean, you know, a lot of areas are making progress. I used to live in Los Angeles back in the late 1980s, and it's certainly better now than it was then. Beijing is, is getting better too. I mean, I mean, China is, they are focused on the issue of, of, of fixing this problem. And I think eventually they will. I mean, uh, 20 years from now, China will be, you know, the air's, the air's going to be a lot cleaner than it is today. Martin, I appreciate you taking the time today. Where can we send everybody to check you out? The books easily found on Amazon, the, the big one, Rise of the Robots easily found. Where can we send people online? I think there's a couple different locations we can send them to. You can check out my Twitter feed, which is mfordfuture. And I have a, a website or and a blog, which is also mfordfuture.com. The company I mentioned, Genesis Systems, uh, doing the water technology is at genesissystems.global. Those are the main places to check out. Martin, thank you for taking the time today. Thank you. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. 
But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.